welcome to Money, Money, Money. I'm Sumera Abadi. The end of the year typically is when we see a whole host of students heading abroad for higher education. And if you're looking to study within India, then, you know, just add a few more months to this. But irrespective of where a student is headed, higher education is becoming expensive. And therefore, you need to plan well in advance about how you're going to fund it. In fact, this is an exercise that parents need to start years in advance. If not, there are education loans which are available as well. So we'll discuss both the aspects, how to be financially prepared if your kids are still young. And you can invest to create that corpus or if kids are already old enough, how to opt for a loan. Vishal Dhawan, founder and CEO of Plan Ahead Advisors, now joins in. Hi, Vishal. Thanks very much for joining in. So when we talk about education, the one thing that we want to talk about first is education inflation. You know, what is it? How much has it been in the past? And what is the rate at which it's likely to trend going forward? Thanks, Omera, for having me over. I think this is a, an extremely important topic, and I think it requires a lot of attention from parents. Um, so typically, the way we look at education is that most people tend to think about education as the tuition cost, which comes with education. But actually, you have a whole lot of other costs which come along with that as well. So uh, for example, there is a cost of living. Most or very often, uh, children live away from home when they're doing higher education. So there is a cost of hostel, or maybe they have an apartment which they're sharing with someone. All of those costs go into cost of living. Their food there, uh, textbooks. Uh, now there's technology. So you know there's laptop upgrades, uh, other software that might be required, et cetera. And then, of course, there is the, tra the travel cost. So if you're uh, you know, sending your child to live in a city outside, then you may be visiting the children, uh, the child uh, you know, often, or the child might be coming back to India if he's overseas. So all of these are effectively costs that come together when you think about education inflation. Uh, over the last 10 years or so, education inflation has roughly been between 10 and 12% per year. So very clearly, it's much higher than what happens for other items, which are more like 6 to 8% per annum. And there doesn't seem to be any evidence yet that this rate of inflation is going to slow down in the future. So I think when you're planning for it, you'd once again at least want to plan for a 10% per annum sort of inflation as far as education is concerned. Okay. Uh, should education inflation only be considered if kids are looking to go abroad? Or does it matter even for, say, uh, premier colleges in India? Well, I think education inflation is there everywhere. I think the triggers for it may be different in different geographies. So, for example, if you're planning to send your children overseas, you could find that there are triggers coming from a combination of just the increase in cost of education plus the currency depreciation. While if you're looking at Indian costs, even at the premier institutions, let's say the most premier institutions in India are the IITs and the IIMs. If you look at those as well, you can see fairly substantial amounts of inflation taking place there. Because one of the common threads that's happening everywhere is an upgrade, upgradation of infrastructure. And obviously that comes with cost. Uh, the second is, you know, uh, academic costs are going up for teachers, et cetera, and therefore there are cost increases happening there as well. And thirdly, in most geographies, including India, uh, the private sector is taking over as far as education is concerned as well. And therefore you end up once again seeing that inflation is, a, is something that you need to plan for irrespective of where your child is going to. And, uh, you know, it's not just the tuition fees itself, right, but the costs associated. If you're looking to live in another city, I mean, forget another country, but, you know, you have to pay rent. Uh, you know, rents are through the roofs in some of these big cities. So it's not just tuition, right? Uh, Vishal, you recommend that the, uh, the funding for this education should include everything, the entire ecosystem. Absolutely. I think one of the great ways for people to plan for this is to actually go out and speak to parents whose children are actually, you know, uh, having um, uh, higher education costs currently happening. And if they look at only tuition, they may be surprised at how small it is as co in comparison to all the other costs that are associated with it. Yeah. But uh, would you recommend for those who are looking to save, like say somebody has a 10 year plus kind of a time horizon, uh, the child plan the, uh, that's available through mutual funds or, uh, you know, insurance companies, is that recommended or would you recommend a more diversified uh, portfolio? 
I think one of the most important things when you're planning for education or any goal which is 10 years plus out is that you need a lot of flexibility because it's very difficult to know exactly when you require the money, how much money will be required in which year, etc. And therefore, look for solutions that are flexible. I think that's where you'd find that you know child insurance plans typically are not very flexible because they very often you know have a template which goes with it, which assumes that you will require the money at a certain phase, etc. Uh, as far as child mutual funds are concerned, they are very much like aggressive hybrid funds, which means that they have roughly between 65 to 80 percent of the money in equities and the balance in uh, in debt. And they do tend to have a minimum five year lock in. Now, what happens is that if you're looking to invest in anything which has equities in it, as you get closer to the requirement of money, you want to be able to get more conservative because you don't want to get hit by a, by a sudden shock that happens when you require the money and find that equity markets have fallen just when you wanted to draw out of that. And I think that's why diversified strategies are actually very good because in the initial phase, you can be aggressive, invest in equity because you have time in your hands and you can therefore get potentially a higher return. As you get closer to the requirement of money, you start to move to debt. And also how much you pull out of those monies can vary depending on finally which course your child goes to and how you ultimately choose to fund it. Okay. Um, uh, Vishal, uh, the other thing is for somebody, I mean, uh, you're investing according to the child's risk profile, I'm assuming. So it would be pretty much similar to everybody who's looking to uh, start creating this corpus, right? So would you recommend this uh, similar kind of asset allocation in their uh, portfolio as well? Not really. I think the decision in terms of how to uh, choose this mix of assets should be driven by how many years you have to get to the point where you start to have to starting to draw down. So the longer time frame you have, the more money you could have exposed to equities. The shorter the time frame you have, the lesser amount of money that should go to equities. Because you definitely don't want to have a situation where something that happens either globally in India uh, or in India means that your corpus actually becomes much smaller than what it was. So, uh, Vishal, the other thing is, how would uh, somebody manage the currency depreciation on their education goal? So, two things very, very importantly there. One is factor that in while you're planning. I think what tends to happen is very often we see uh, parents, you know, take today's cost of education overseas and then multiply it by today's currency rate and then get a number, and then they tend to grow that number. I think just like you're applying inflation on education, you also need to apply uh, currency depreciation because traditionally, the Indian currency has depreciated by 3 to 5% uh, every year over a period of time. In addition to that, if you have time on your hands, uh, you're, you're starting off soon enough, then you definitely can take advantage of the fact that you can also buy international investments in India today. And therefore, you could be buying, for example, a dollar-based investment itself, which means that over a period of time, the currency depreciation may not be something that you have to worry about. You can only focus your energy around the, uh, the inflation on the education itself. Okay. Uh, with that, we're going to take a very quick break. Vishal stays on with us. And uh, on the other side, we'll talk about how to go about if you need to take an education loan. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, welcome back to Money, Money, Money. Vishal Dhawan of Plan Ahead Wealth Advisors is still with us and we're talking about how to fund your child's higher education. So we've discussed how to go about saving if you have enough time on your hands. But if you don't, what is the other option? Well, it's an education loan. But before we talk about the nitty gritties of an education loan, how to go shopping for one and so on, Let's discuss whether an education loan is a good loan or not. Uh, Vishal, is this something that you recommend uh, to fund higher education? So I think it's uh, definitely something that can be considered, but one has to do it very, very carefully and prudently because you need to realize that both for parents as well as for children, there is going to be a very material impact on their finances the moment they choose to use a loan. 
the interest rates on many of these education loans are actually quite high, uh, especially if you don't get admissions into a very high quality institution. Uh, typically, you know, if you went to a public sector bank, it would be about 10, 11% per annum. If you went to a, a private sector uh, bank or a NBFC, anywhere between 11 and 15% per annum. So it is expensive. And therefore, you have to be very, very clear that there has to be confidence that at the end of this uh, education, there is an ability to have income, uh, which will be able to support that loan repayment back. Uh, so clearly, if, if it results in a very high quality education, it is definitely a good uh, sort of loan to have. If it doesn't, then it's going to put you back as a parent, either because you've compromised on your retirement or as a child, because you're just struggling to pay off the EMI when you start off, then I don't think it's such a great idea. Okay. Uh, what are the factors to consider when someone is looking to apply for a loan or shopping for a loan? So a few things uh, very, very clearly. One is, like I mentioned earlier, the course has to be right. Because if you have to be able to pay back a loan, you need to be sure that the kind of salaries that you'll get at the end of that program, because the job prospects are good, are going to be um, sort of uh, worth the expense on the loan. Uh, obviously, if you're going to become an entrepreneur, then you have to think extra hard because you may not have income immediately to be able to support that. So one is the course itself. The second is the rate of interest. Uh, like I was mentioning earlier, the rates of interest can be very high. But if you get into a very high quality institution, then those rates are substantially lower. And of course, if you're going overseas, you might also be able to get the benefit of taking a loan in the currency uh, that you're actually going to be paying your fee in, which can happen again, uh, you know, as an option if you go to a good quality institution. The third thing to keep in mind is how long are you going to take to pay this loan back? Because what ends up happening with repayments is that very often, uh, you know, we tend to believe that we want it to go on longer and longer so that it becomes more affordable. On the flip side, we need to keep in mind that the longer the loan is, the more overall interest you're going to end up paying. And therefore, you want to find a balance uh, if you can. So earlier on, most education loans were only seven years. Now you have loans which go on till 15 years. Um, but you need to keep this you know, very carefully done so that you don't overpay interest as well. Because if you think about a 15-year loan, after you pass out of an higher education, you'll be probably in your mid-30s by the time you finish paying off your loan itself. Uh, the fourth thing to keep in mind is that there is a tax deduction available for eight years, uh, but that again should not be the only reason why you take the loan. Uh, that tax deduction is sort of a good thing to happen, but but uh, you know try to keep in mind that it's only available for the interest that you pay in the first eight years. Uh, keep in mind also that you will have margins to pay out on these loans, and you will also have a processing fee. Uh, typically, you know most processing fees will be about one percent. And last but not the least, keep in mind the concept of a moratorium on an education loan, which is essentially the period during which you will get charged interest on the loan. Uh, you know, for example, a lot of public sector banks will charge you simple interest on the loan during that period. So you don't have to pay the EMI for maybe six months or 12 months after you finish your program, but you're still accumulating interest on the loan during that period. And therefore, you're ending up paying a higher amount because of the moratorium. So there are lots of factors to keep in mind before you go ahead and, and say yes to that education loan. Okay. Um, Vishal, uh, how should the repayment of an education loan be handled? Do you recommend uh, prepaying? Because you said there is this fine balance between uh, you know, finishing it off uh, early enough or having other implications. So uh, do, to what extent is prepayment recommended? It's definitely a recommendation. Uh, for you to have freedom as a person who's finished his higher education to start doing a lot of other things. Because if you look through the uh, sort of career journey of someone, you would find that you know, you're happier off paying the loan off for the first few years. And then you want to get into other things in your life. Maybe you want to become an entrepreneur. Maybe you want to buy a house. Uh, maybe you want to uh, you know, uh, settle down with a family. So there are lots of other things that will come into play over a period of time. So it's very ideal that as you get bonuses, uh, you use some of those monies to actually pay back money uh, on your loan. 
uh, if you know you can save money during your program itself by you know let's say opting for second hand books or you know technology which may not have to be the newest technology when you're buying a laptop um, you know looking for cheaper housing a lot of those things can actually help you keep your loans down or even if you've taken a higher loan enable you to prepay faster and i think that's a very very good thing to do um, last but not the least i think i would also very strongly suggest that you know you should be setting aside payments for loan repayments in a separate bank account so that you don't end up spending it on something else uh, because there is so much of temptation all the time to be able to sort of use the money fungibly somewhere else okay uh vishal any practical tips you want to share because uh you know for uh, somebody who hasn't yet applied for a loan or uh, you know just about started saving my son is still very young uh for people like us what are the practical tips that you can tell us so i think one of the things that uh, you know doesn't get a lot of attention is the whole bit around opting for scholarships there's definitely an opportunity there as well there are scholarships available for both deserving as well as uh, needy students especially if you get into a very high quality institution so look for those options uh speak to people who are senior to sort of understand you know what are the other ways that you can uh, earn some money while in your program maybe it's an internship maybe it's a part time job uh, there are lots of opportunities available for bright uh, bright people uh look at your uh, you know when when you're saving uh do think very carefully about you know how as a parent uh, you want to support the uh, education uh, sort of provisioning because what tends to happen is very often goals tend to compete against each other let's say you want to upgrade your home as a parent and there's an education on the other side uh, sometimes because the house upgrade is more here and now and the education is out there in the future there might be a tendency to prioritize the house today and say that you know i can always take care of the education later on and then you might find that you run short uh look at bonuses both for yourself as well as you know when a student starts off to basically you know increase his provisions for education and uh like always you know use all your increments very prudently i think there is a tendency for expenses to go up with increments i think it's great if you are provisioning towards education can actually go up every time um you know there is an increment that comes either for you as a parent or or for the student uh, himself or herself okay uh wish i just one final question before we wrap up you know just as a ballpark figure i mean i don't know if you have any data on this uh but if say i want to start saving for my child's education the only cost uh that is available to me the concrete cost is a tuition fees right but as we discuss that it's a very small portion of what i'm going to have to end up paying so what is that ballpark figure i mean tuition fees uh, fees plus what x should i look to save i mean considering so it, that it is an, a moving target correct so i wouldn't say it's a very small part but it's it's substantial enough so what tends to happen is that if you're uh, thinking about the overall picture uh you would typically find that in a country like india assuming you're going to a higher education within the country itself it's likely that your costs for everything else put together are going to be about 20 25% and 70 75% or so will be you know other costs uh, will be tuition costs if you're going overseas this proportion may be slightly different uh because the cost of living itself is much higher there and you might therefore find that about 60 to 70% is your tuition fees and everything else comes around with that so so i think you know you would have to uh look at what is happening in there and i think as a parent the toughest thing to know when you're 10 15 years out is to know actually whether your child is going to study overseas or going to be studying in a high quality institution in india but uh, you know best to safe to the extent that's possible today so that uh, you can look to make that decision later on because you know this is one of those goals which can neither be delayed nor dropped right so best to save for it much in advance vishal thank you very much for joining in and for giving us a lot of these practical solutions as well with that we're going to wind up on money 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 thank you very much for watching do stay tuned to cnbc tv 18